when I first started to learn about TCP, an idea that I had was how cool would it be is if I could somehow fully establish a TCP session with a server using spoofed credentials. So using raw sockets to generate the SYN packet and then somehow generate the acknowledgement back and establish a TCP session completely off path. And that, that's also, I later found out that's what's also known as an off path attack using completely spoofed information, but yet still managed to establish the, the session. But the problem being is you don't see the SYN act. So if you're spoofing an IP address and the SYN act is going to the spoofed address, not you, how do you generate, how do you create the acknowledgement in order to, to fully establish the session? You're going to leave the server half open, just like in a SYN flood. In order to generate the acknowledgement, what you need is the sequence number. You need the initial sequence number that's going to be sitting in the SYN ACK from the server. So of course, remember that each side of each connection, client, server, both needs to have their own stuff. Both needs to have their own port information, IP information, and they're both going to need their own set of sequence numbers. And each are completely independent of each other and generated completely randomly. So unless you know the initial sequence number, the starting point of the SYN ACK, there's no way to actually craft or forge an acknowledgement from the client and then send it back in order to establish the session. So after about 15 minutes of thinking about it, I realized, okay, we can't do this unless I had already configured some type of man in the middle situation where I was sniffing the packets coming in and could somehow see the SYNAC and then quickly generate the acknowledgement. But at that point, it's just, it, everything's too difficult. After a little bit of research, I discovered that in 1985, a computer scientist working for Bell Labs named Robert T. Morris had actually done this. And the reason he was able to do this was because he discovered a vulnerability in the method that BSD 4.2 issues its initial sequence numbers. So, okay. Now, back in those days, the, the BSD systems that they used didn't really have a whole lot of authentication going on. They didn't use SSH or anything. They used R login. R login, you can specify um, a, a list of devices that can are authorized to to access that server. So there's a list of IP addresses. Mr. Morris had the same idea I did. If you could spoof one of those addresses and fully establish a TCP session, you could then send code to that server granting you access. Well, by modern standards, restricting access to a server just simply by IP address sounds absolutely ludicrous. And it, it, you're thinking, oh, how easy it is to spoof an IP address. Well, if you're on the same subnet as an authorized device, yeah, that's super easy. All you have to do is change your IP to one of the authorized device. Okay, on a modern network, we have things like dynamic ARP inspection and some other things to prevent that or to at least help mitigate that sort of thing. Um, but it's still a trivial act in order to, you know, just assume the identity of an authorized device. But if you're behind a router, if you're not on the same subnet as an authorized device, if you're on any other subnet in the world, it's actually still fairly difficult to pull off. How do you establish, fully establish a TCP session um, it, with a device, which you can, you could always do, but then how do you authorize the device if there's a list of authorized IP addresses? It's still kind of hard, actually. Well, what Mr. Morris did is, well, I got the paper right here, and this is effectively a blueprint for this hack. And what he did is he used raw sockets, just like I was describing earlier. So he was able to craft a SYN packet and then guess the initial sequence number of the SYN ACK and then craft an acknowledgement. And then boom, he's established. Well, he had two problems. The, the two problems first, number one problem is how do you guess the initial sequence number coming out of that SYN ACK? How did he know what that sequence number is going to be coming from a server. The, he doesn't see the SYNAC because the SYNAC is being sent to the legitimate authorized device. So he doesn't, it's completely invisible to him because it's not even being sent to him. So how does he generate that? How does he generate that acknowledgement completing the three-way handshake? So that's the first problem. Well, the second problem is, well, that SYNAC coming from the server is going to go to the legitimate device. And what does 
a a device do when it gets a, 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 a TCP packet that is completely unaware of? Well, it sends a reset because the legitimate device is not listening, is not in the send sent state. So it's not listening for that response. It doesn't know anything about that, that SYNAC, so it just sends a reset. So he's got two problems there, how to prevent that reset and how to guess the, the, the initial sequence number. Well, the first problem really was the entire purpose of the paper, guessing the initial sequence number. Um, back in those days in BSD 4.2, the sequence numbers were, were incremented starting at zero and, and stepping up 128 per second. And I think this translates to um, every four, oh, I'm sorry, every eight microseconds, it's going to increment by one. So 128 per second. So, you know, for every second that that network adapter has been initialized, it's going to increment by 128. So, okay, that's guessable. Well, also for each, each subsequent TCP connection that is established, it also increments by 64. So what he did in order to guess it is kind of simple. He just sent a whole bunch of TCP connections, legitimate ones that he can then capture the SYNAC on. And he wasn't attempting to actually establish the sessions at this point. He just wanted to capture the initial sequence numbers being generated and then observe the pattern. And the pattern incremented sequentially by 64 each time. And so generating the acknowledgement afterwards was a trivial. I mean, he just generated, he just sent the, um, sent the fake sin and then he incremented by 64 and then added one for the sin packet and he generated the ACK. Okay. So then at that point he has established the session, but he has problem number two to deal with. And problem number two is actually pretty easy because problem number two, where the sin ACK is being sent to the legitimate host. Um, in order to prevent that reset from being sent, what he did was he knew, knew that the legitimate host was a terminal and it was listening on port 21, which I think, what is that, FTP or something like that? I think it's FTP. Yeah. So it was listening on port 21. So what did he do is he sent a SYN flood to port 21. Okay. So sent a SYN flood to port 21 and then crafted his SYN packet to use a source port of 21. And so what happened was he effectively muted that, that, that legitimate client. So when the SYN ACK from the server got sent to the, the legitimate client, it couldn't respond. It was too busy handling that SYN flood. So no reset got sent. And so he was able to um, effectively and repeatedly establish these TCP sessions over and over again. So it worked and it was repeatable. And he documented it in a, in, in a paper now known as Morris 1985. In the early 90s, and I, can't, I should have done more research. I believe it was 94, but I probably could be wrong. It might even be, have been 92 um, or 93, but somewhere in that range, Kevin Mitnick used this exact attack. In fact, I'm fairly certain he used this Morris document as a blueprint in order to pull off what's now known as the Mitnick attack, where he was able to um, fully establish a TCP session with an FBI server. So that's, yeah, it's fairly impressive. Now, the thing about the Mitnick attack, you should probably, probably look this up, um, is the Mitnick attack uses the Morris attack almost to the T and, and it worked brilliantly, but it was many years later. It was six, seven, eight, nine years later. I mean, I don't even know exactly when, but it was a long time later and, and, and nobody had patched it by then. And especially FBI servers. I, I don't know. I think security worked much slower back then. Um, but yeah, he was able to fully attack and establish a TCP session using and everything was completely the same and so what the mitnick attack did is once he established the session he was able to send a socket um a packet with a payload that gave him that then gave him access and it was a simple it was an r login like command giving uh, all access to every ip address so the scenario was exactly the same and the funny thing was in the wiki I looked up of the Mitnick attack. It says that 
Kevin Mitnick was the first one to actually do this. So maybe he was the first one to do this in the wild, but he certainly wasn't the first one to do this. Um, but the brilliance of the Mitnick attack was not the attack itself, but it was the information gathering. It's how did he know the IPs of the server and of the client? And then he was able to scan them and find out the port information and able to find out that information. That's the brilliance of it. How did he know the IPs of these servers? So in May of 1996, uh, RFC 1948 was, um, was drafted and that was possibly a response to Mitnick's attack. And it specifies a method of deriving the initial sequence number that uses a cryptographic component plus the incrementing sequentially component that BSD 4.2 systems used to do of somehow um, incrementing every eight microseconds appended to a cryptographic component, like possibly MD5 or something like that, some type of random function. And it was really left up to, and it still is left up to the operating system vendor in order to, to make sure that the initial sequence numbers are thoroughly randomized. And they really are. And I did find a study a while ago. Um, somebody tested in the early, I think it was the early 2000s and tested various operating systems. And uh, Linux did fine. OpenBSD actually kind of did terrible, but this was in the early 2000s, so I'll give them a break. OpenVMS, horrible. Yeah, OpenVMS, they, yeah, they were bad. But, um, and so somebody did a test of the randomness of the initial sequence numbers, which the the less random they really are, the, the, the more um, vulnerable to this type of attack they, they could be. So really by today's standards, this type of attack is, is completely useless. But the funny thing is in Kali Linux, there's still a, a, an, a little app and I haven't checked it out in a while, but um, there's a, still an app that allows you to, to target a host and then test the, the randomness of initial sequence numbers. And I, I, I looked into it. I, I think I ran it once and yeah, it was pretty darn random. I mean, you would have to do millions and millions of TCP sessions and listen for millions and millions of synax to come back and, and maybe even billions to attempt to find a pattern. I'm not going to find a pattern. There's no way I'm smart enough to find a pattern in this. There might be, but probably not. So this attack is useless, but I thought it was interesting and interesting enough to, to, to make a video on the initial sequence number because it, it, the Mitnick attack, I mean, Kevin Mitnick was a big deal. So, and this was one of his, 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 his attacks that, that really put him on the map as a hacker. So, okay, that's it. Hope you learned something. Thanks for watching.